hot take, I don't think having a good idea for a story makes you a writer. I think writing makes you a writer. When I was just a babe, maybe like 13, 12-ish, I was performing in A Midsummer Night's Dream, and I found out one of the older kids was a writer. They said they had written a whole fantasy series. I asked if I could read it, and they said, not yet, I only wrote it in my head. Now, not to beef with this 14-year-old, but I had actually written a novel at that point, and I was livid. Not to mention, I think this kind of attitude is one you still see in adults that undervalue the actual process of writing, the discipline to put words on a page, the craft that goes into choosing the actual words you're going to use, and so forth. I think this is why some bozos today use AI to generate stuff and thinks this makes them a writer. They didn't even need to finish anything, it didn't need to be good, they just need to put words on paper, or the computer screen, or whatever. The bar for writer identity is low. So if you're watching this, you're probably one of the people that actually wants to write your story. But maybe you don't know how to go from that idea phase to actually starting a novel, or a screenplay, or a video game script. Maybe you're stuck jotting down notes, doing research, and it's intimidating to take that final step and actually start. Today, I'm going to show you my way of developing story ideas, from vibes to actual story with a plot. Now, I want to disclaim that this is not the only way to develop story ideas, but it's a process that you can try to help you feel more confident and ready to write. So, if you don't want to beef with 12-year-old Belle, let's give it a shot! Step zero is you need to have an idea that you want to develop into a story, whether it's a book or a short film or a game script or whatever. If you don't have a story idea, uh, that's actually kind of crazy to me, I have no shortage of ideas, so you can write all of my fairy novels for me. In fact, you can take the one I'm working on today, feel free to use it and um, even sell it one day. Don't care. Um, actually though, I collaborated today with Blue Mooney, a fellow VTuber, writer, and world builder. We each agreed to design and exchange festivals, and from there each would build a world and or story from the other one's festival. I'm actually so excited to see what you made me, so let's go open up my festival video folder. Hi am I goody, Blue here. I have a festival ready for you, and I can't wait to see what you do with it. <laughs> So, this is a moon viewing festival, oh, that's where so the people cute. of this nation gather to admire the beauties of nature and the heavens coming together. This is a celebration of unions, most notably weddings, but most adoptions and significant business deals also occur during the festival. This is also an auspicious time to reconcile disagreements, and it's the biggest annual gathering of, we'll call them river folk. This is okay, celebrated okay. during the first full moon of summer, just before the monsoon rains come. So before the festival can begin, everyone has to get there. The journey begins with the furthest communities living along the inland river branches. The river folks sweep down the river, the highway along which their nation and culture is built. Okay, their numbers so build as they collect river valley civilization along the way. Most travel on ferries or on huge river barges pulled by teams of domesticated kelpies. These kelpies are giant omnivorous river mammals, complete with massive hippopotamus-like jaws. Some river folk also pilot smaller vessels to police and protect the convoy, or to cross between larger vessels if they don't feel like swimming, which they usually do. Swimming is a fundamental skill here, and infants are taken into the water within a few days of birth. People pass the time catching up with friends, swimming, boating, and catching fish. Diving for oysters, or more specifically pearls, is particularly popular among young people, oh, as so is cute. the hunting for suitors. Okay, river pearls. If a crocodile and attacks the convoy, crocodiles. they are fought off by trident-wielding soldiers and usually finished by the jaws of a kelpie. We like tridents. It's a lively procession downriver. Boats and barges are bedecked with flowers and ring kites, and people dance and sing and play their instruments, practicing for the festivities. The entire journey takes two weeks, from the furthest communities all the way to the nation's only city, which spreads around a calm bay, like two hands cupping a goblet. New arrivals immediately join in the festival like preparations of the city dwelling brethren, which includes putting up decorations. Kites are strung all over the city, 
cuts, mostly ring kites, but some are shaped like bioluminescent bay dragons and bay other local dragons. wildlife. Wreaths are twisted of river grass and fine ropes of beads and shells, and are affixed with wooden plaques for people to carve their wishes upon. Much bigger wreaths are made to contain the hopes of the nation. So unions Moon mirrors are polished discs of silver that double as gongs. They're about the size of a dinner plate and are quite expensive. So to ensure everyone can participate fully in the moon viewing, coin-sized versions are passed out at official stalls. And last sidebar, did you know that actual gongs, like handmade gongs, are so expensive? Um, there's a whole thing on this on Business Insider's website, if you don't know. And all of the fancy ones used in Buddhist temples today are like hand pounded out and like there's not like a set way of knowing how to do it you have to do it all by ear it's really crazy you should definitely check out that video also if you haven't large moon mirrors are erected around the city along the river and by the bay okay, so also if they count as decorations many massive bonfires are prepared ringing the bay for folks to congregate around to help non-locals navigate the festivities so we have a lot of and, fuel of course, in this area for cooking and a lot of other on the evening of the celebration folks change flowers. into their cleanest kilts and tunic dresses these are made from hydrophobic bright white textiles harvested from nettle fibers and tunic dresses are typically knee length but some opt for longer flowier more festive skirts on their feet people wear sandals made of leather and river grasses and soldiers on duty don their usual vests of crocodile leather gauntlets and shin guards Okay, we have a it's lot of common for folks to wear belts and necklaces made of leather bands twisted with fine ropes of beads, shells, stones and crocodile teeth. But on festive days they add entire beaded ensembles over their kilts and tunics, wearing elaborate nets of these decorative beads. Some people wear beaded loops as circlets around their brows, while others choose lacy beaded caps. On the front of the circlet or cap is a plain silver disc, either waiting for a pearl or already set with one, either exchanged with a partner or to indicate that you are not in search of a partner. So the moon viewing. There's no one set moment for the moon viewing. As evening falls, folks come to the bay as they please, to gather with friends, to eat and drink, to lay their wish okay, reeds, so and to admire the moon and its reflection down in the bay, to the bay and in their moon with mirror gongs, away from they the strike as a sign moon, of so never see the moon. Okay, and they all Many and also hit swim the gongs by the luminescent water dragons. Of course, there's Different lots of soldiers crocodiles. on duty to rescue those whose swimming skills diminish with drunkenness. So, food culture here revolves around preparing and eating meals communally, with a particular emphasis on foods that require minimal preparation to achieve ultimate taste. Folks lay out mats and sit together on the ground in large circles to share their feast. Near yeah, every bonfire are mounds of fresh fruit. Rice, in this tropical climate, there's a huge rice, variety to choose from, including melons, now. citrus fruits, palm fruits, and coconuts. Numerous drink stations serve fresh water, coconut milk, fruit juice, and fruit honey wine. There is a ridiculous array of seafood to choose from. Fish, crayfish, crabs, scallops, oysters, squid, and anemones, which are all brushed with marinades of seed oil and spiced fruit purees. People okay, bring their own steel skewers and either pies. consume their seafood raw or cook it over the bonfire. And skewers can be mixed up with vegetables such as shallots and mushrooms. If you want crocodile on your skewer, you've got to eat early. It's very popular and supplies are always limited. Also on offer are discs of bread dumplings baked over the bonfire. These bread dumplings are made dumplings. from oil and flour from crushed seeds and nuts, with sweet versions adding honey and fruit to the dough. Another popular festival food is smoked bay tubers. These small curved purple tubers are wrapped in seaweed and cooked on the coals of the bonfire. And a popular snack while walking around the festivities are strips of roasted seaweed. Oh, Aside always, from admiring always. nature in the heavens, there are many other events that folks take part in. There's a mass wedding by the bay at midnight. Most couples choose to participate, but some prefer a more private ceremony. Officials set up stalls around the city to mediate business deals, to officiate adoptions and to solve arguments, but it's definitely not all business. Traditional dances are performed in the shallows of the bay, with hundreds of dancers sweeping in slow synchronized patterns through the water, all wielding long wooden sticks which they clack together with changing partners, adding to the percussion of the huge deep drums, queer rows, and massive silver gongs. 
Long low notes abode on the one-stringed harp, while choruses of thousands vocalize ancient chants. Dissonant chords are common in the music here, but songs always end resolved. Other festival events include aquatic ac acrobatics and diving competitions, as well as swimming, boating, and kelpie races. It must be more For children, there are activities such as stone skimming, kite making, kelpie rides, and folk stories. The most famous being the story of the daughter of a village leader who courted a child of the moon. And their doomed love gave birth to the bioluminescent water dragons that return to the bay every summer when the moon child above is reunited with their love below. And that is the Moon Viewing Festival. Oh my gosh. I hope so much you can have some fun with it. Oh no, I'm going to have so much fun with this. Oh, this is going to be great. Okay. I really like what she's given me so far. It's giving me big, like, uh, I think it's something about the crocodiles, although America might have gators, so. But something about it's giving me big Louisiana vibes, big New Orleans vibes, like where the wild things are. Um... There's that's not actually this movie I'm thinking of. There's this movie, maybe where the crawdads sing. It's mm, this movie about this guy and his girl, and they live a, and they're like kind of looking for the girl's mother, but not really. It's like magical realism nonsense stuff, mm, and uh, he they just go on adventures. And at some point, she like he makes her like split open a lobster with her bare hands and eat it. Oh, but she's like four, so she can't do it very well. It was a really weird movie, but it really stuck with me. This is giving me similar vibes, but like more fantasy. Anyway, step one is the brainstorming step. This is where I start to flesh out my idea. Now you might say, but Belle, wasn't that festival really fleshed out? Yeah, Blue did a great job. It's super fabulous. The problem is that a festival isn't a story, okay? There is no conflict. There is no informational twists or reveals. It's a vibe. It's a system of government, cultural beliefs, available mm, well, resources. That's not a story yet. I like to start with characters generally. That's what emotionally anchors me. But you should start with whatever makes you excited about a story. Now, I'm a really visual person, so usually I'll sc scroll through Pinterest and um, maybe do some sketching. Uh, this all serves to give me the vibes of the characters, because I do a lot based off of... I, I pick up a lot of information just off of seeing something, and then my mind just goes. Um, lately, the character archetype I've wanted to play with the most is the idea of a girl who just constantly lies about everything. Like, all the facets of her act life is just an act. Total sociopath, but not in an evil way. It's all a trauma response. Oh, only plus, if this is a festival about moon viewing, and she's the protagonist, and she has moon theming, it's because she changes her face depending on when you're looking at her. Eh? Eh? Okay, um, the other way I dig into characters is I look for unique and interesting job positions implied by the narrative. And in this setting, that's the Kelpie tamers and writers, the Kelpies themselves, maybe. Uh, the bioluminescent dragons, or whoever interacts with them, like dragon priests and priestesses. Um, crocodile hunters, that sounds neat. Uh, whoever drives the boats. And of course, faction leaders, always interesting. Um, since this festival is about unions, maybe this story is one of those enemies to lovers romanticies that are so popular right now. So that's a place where I can jump off. So maybe sociopath girl is trying to get married. Um, as I mentioned before, this seems like a pretty cooperation-focused society. I bet there's a lot of tribalism if it's like vaguely 1600s Renaissance era fantasy, but I like to bump my work up to the 1750s, which is admittedly, you know, my favorite spot in general, um, because that's when we invented dueling pistols and they were widely available. So easily accessible guns are changing combat forever. But we haven't quite hit Civil War, World War One levels of fighting revolutions yet, where it's like people run out into a field and just die and it's really sad. Um, so yeah, we were like on the cusp there. Um, oh, and if we do that, maybe we could have it so that there's just a revolt because of the invention of guns or whatever the equivalent is. And a, and a lot of sociopath girls' family or boat or whatever just got absolutely rocked. Or maybe, like, she's, like, a minor boat family that was going to merge with the biggest boat people. The headwater ships, we could call them. Um, and then they live in the most mountainous part of the river system and control all the downstream water. And, uh... Yeah, and then not to mention they'd be the herald of the start of this moon viewing festival, since it starts at the top of the river and then to the bottom. Uh, and previously they were unbeatable because they controlled the headwaters and probably had, like, magic that had to do with that. But now, with the invention of guns... And their rivals armed a rebellion to take them out. 
Or, like I said, we could make them not guns. It could be magic. Maybe we're weaponizing magic gongs or something. Uh, regardless, sociopath girl now still wants to climb through society through marriage, since she doesn't have magic or guns. Um, I'm imagining since it's, we've got the whole, excuse me, um, we've got the whole one pearl per necklace thing. We probably have monogamy, uh, or normalized since, um, and it probably symbolizes monetary merging as much as it symbolizes love. Um, maybe with the Headwaters' main line of succession disrupted, she was going to try to figure out, uh, like, how to succeed the family taking over them and marry whoever was getting, um, whoever's going to take over without getting ousted by other smaller families like hers. Um, now, is this just a fantasy political drama again? Yes, sorry. <laughs> I suppose I could have made it into, like, an idol story about the rising musician artist in society not winning a singing dancing competition, or maybe an action adventure about finding the true meaning of life at this festival at the end of the river. Uh, maybe it could have been like a grumpy parent figure and their sunshine child as they journey downriver to get the kid a real family. Like I was saying, like where the crawdads sing, maybe. <laughs> I don't know what that movie is. Um, and then they find out the real family is the family they made along the way. Um, but this is what I get for loving liars and sociopaths and media. I they work best in stories about manipulating people. And those are only interesting if the stakes are high. I mean, I guess we could give we could give uh, our our protagonist a subplot about her being a dancer. Um, though, if I were doing that, I'm not sure I would want to make it a written story like prose. Um, I just think dance and music stories tend to work best in audiovisual mediums because, you know, the written verb word doesn't really convey the same vibe as watching someone dance and sing. Like that tells you so much. Um, more than just reading about it. Anyway, just from this really rough outline, we sounds like we've got some big themes like change, because the river and the moon symbols, yeah. Uh, unions, um, what it means to like be work with people, uh, truth and lies, and identity. Oh, and of course the uses and abuses of power, since it's political drama, so like that's always the central thing of political dramas. Um, maybe the central question is how do you trust again after your trust is violated? And then all the factions and characters can have their own answer to that question. So for the characters we really want to dig deep on, we have the protagonist, sociopath girl, and then we'll give her three suitor enemies who are all vying for the throne. Um, I always think two feels too unbalanced. Uh, and then we can figure out, and then we can have a figure from her past that she actually despises and will not tolerate no matter what. Um, I tend to think of rule of five when I'm building up factions, because that's how Magic the Gathering does it. And it gives you enough that some ideologies overlap a little bit, and you have some, and all of them, but all of them have rivals and allies. And there's no good or evil, it's just like, you know, this interconnected web of people that are all like, that all like or dislike somebody. Um, I'm, I don't know, I'm just not that big a fan of uh, good versus evil narratives anymore. I think that they're just, they're like... I don't know, they're very simple, and I don't think it's a very good reflection of reality, so it doesn't really allow me to explore emotions in the way that I like. So I guess the next step would be I'd start doing, like, flesh out the characters more. I could spend all day figuring out what food they liked or what linguistics quirks they have. Um, I mean, that'll be important at some point. But the two things I really need to know right now are goal and motivation. So for a sociopath girl, let's call her Sogi. So she's got a name. Um, I'd probably make a whole conlang, by the way, for this, so that we could figure out, like, how to name everybody, but that's not within the scope of this video. So, Sogi it is. Sogi's goal is to get married. Specifically, she wants to ensure that her family has power. Why? Because she never wants to be betrayed again. She never wants to be powerless and helpless and vulnerable again, and that's why her whole life is a lie. Because you can't destroy someone who doesn't have anything real about them. Um... And then for her past figure that she despises, uh, we could make them really despicable, but she's already a liar and stuff, and I like the idea that this person is nice and good. What if it's like her mom, okay, and her mom is super gentle and aggressively honest and kind of naive, and she is the one who put Sogi up to get married. But mother's goal has nothing to do with Sogi being happy and safe, it's about uniting the community, because she's like a good person, right? So. Mm, um, Sogi's mom wants what's best for everyone, and Sogi hates this because so mom doesn't consider what Sogi wants and needs. So despite how gentle and sweet she is, she's really neglected Sogi's. 
uh, needs, and maybe she even, like, has a breakdown, and she's like, oh, I'm such a horrible mother every time Sogi has tried to say anything about it, and so Sogi has just learned to be clever and lie to seem happy and grateful all the time, and so she hates her mother now. Okay, I already love this relationship so much. It's so toxic and complicated, and media illiterate children on TikTok are gonna scream about how problematic it is, and I'm so excited. Okay, next, the love interests. Um, each one needs to have a different answer to how do you trust again. I think one has to have an answer similar to Sogi. He'll be like this famous crocodile hunter soldier guy, so he already has an adversarial relationship to his environment that like works out nicely. And maybe he just sees the world mm, as like uh, the strongest always win. Oh, but unlike Sogi, he's not bitter about it. He's just at peace with the idea that the best man will win, whoever it is. And so this guy's core motivation then is order. He wants the natural order of the world to be upheld, whatever that means to him. And so cheaters and anomalies have to be perched, but everyone else is valid. Um, I also, okay, I also like the idea that something terrible is going to happen at the end of this two-week journey down the river, um, and then you have a built-in ticking time bomb, like an assassination or another attack is being planned. Oh, and it can go off during Sogi's dance recital theory, mm, um, and I like the idea that this guy is beside the, is, is, um, behind it because he's, like, a hunter type already, like, it makes sense, he has the resources to do it. Um, so one suitor should have the opposite answer to Sogi, uh, that you should fix the problem and then forgive and trust people. And this one, I guess we should have one male, one female, one non-binary character since we have three suitors. Uh, so this is going to be the non-binary one. Uh, maybe they're a Kelpie tamer, so they're used to having to communicate with creatures that don't understand them. And uh, so, like, what if they're, like, the gentle heir to the branch family of the headwater ship boat people? And so now they're being shoved up to consolidate power to keep um, the headwater family, main family, from, like, vanishing and being cannibalized. Um, and so he would hate them originally, because they remind her of mother. So this suitor's goal is to, like, fix the problem, the socio-political problem that caused this revolution in the first place, and try to keep the peace. And maybe their motivation is, like, they want to be loved, because the last headwaters ruled through fear, so they want to be loved so people don't try to kill them. That's interesting. I like that. Um, so the last year is a lady, and... Maybe she doesn't believe in trust or lack of trust in relationships at all. I'm not sure how that would work. Um, regardless, maybe she maybe she's the rebel faction leader. Like, maybe there was a... So the real rebel faction was put down, and she's trying to make amends. And But she's part of that faction that broke the trust, so her statement on how do you trust people is basically, you don't. You create a system of incentives where it will never benefit people to betray you. And she wants some sort of power shift... Um, but she wants it non-violently, because she sees the guns or whatever equivalent as making it easier and easier to do something violent. Uh, and she wants to prevent that early. Oh, maybe to help give her uh, legitimacy, she's the like she's a dragon-talking person, one of the dragon priests. She's a dragon priestesses. And maybe like the sleeping dragons represent the will of the people or something. I don't know, just, just food for thought. So yeah, that's them. That's probably like the main cast. And then all these people are, I, I like all these people already. I think they're really dynamic characters with distinctive goals and motivations. And I think it's super clear how they'd act in a bunch of different situations now. By the way, if I were doing this for real, this is where I would do research into real life cultures with these elements to enrich my world building with the ways that other cultures have handled resource and environmental pressures in our world. Um, and that, I think, makes it feel like a really real place. Like, in the same way that realizing that if you live in a frozen place, you have to melt ice for water. Or if you live in a super hot place, you need to find ways to not overheat all of the time. Like, you can't just sit in the sun and grow and leave water out or whatever. You gotta, like, I mean, a hot, dry place. I suppose if you live in a hot, humid place, you can just wait for it to rain again or whatever. So, yeah, I think that's mm, a really important aspect of world building um, uh, fantasy. Um, so, like I mentioned with the crawfish and the boat reliance, and, and, like, that always making me think of Louisiana. So, um, like, for this, I just, I'd Wikipedia New Orleans history. And just from skimming this page, I find things like, nicknamed the Crescent City. Hey, crescents, moons, hey, hey. See, it's great. Um, it, oh, colonized by the French, struggle with the Natchez tribe. See, that's something that I don't know anything about. Uh, leading directly into the Chicksaw Wars. Jesus Christ, there's so much violence in this one city. Holy shit. Um, 
Afro-Creole society get called on past cultures and situations for slaves in the New World associated with voodoo. Yeah, okay, so, like, there's so much stuff here that you could like, dig into and figure out how to do and, like, incorporate. Um, I actually have an uncle who grew, grew up in, 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 like, New Orleans. New, Ar New, New Orleans. <laughs> they say it. They, that's how the locals kind of say it. I can't do it. Um... And I'd also probably prepare for needing sensitivity readers because there's a lot of shit happening with cultural groups here that I'm not a part of. So if I was really serious about doing this, I'd want to dig a lot deeper. I feel like a lot of people say that they want to dig deeper into cultures and stuff, um, and they don't really talk about how deep it needs to go, so let me clarify. To write authentically about a place I don't know anything about, I want to ensure I am deeply familiar with multiple and ideally intercultural, racial, intergender, interregional perspectives on a single area, on a single culture at a single time period. So this isn't a one Wikipedia page kind of research level, it's a read three different textbooks by different historians who disagree with each other kinds of research. That's the kind of level of research you need to do to understand a place that is not your culture, basically. Um, to have it be done truly respectfully, because it is so easy to stumble to just do whatever the mass media tells us is about a place, or to slip into stereotypes about a region or something without even realizing it. And then, and now you're just spreading misinformation, basically. Or, and even if you're like, well, everybody knows that, like, so and so, that, like, you know, um, I think my go to example is that all Asian people, everyone knows that not all Asian people just eat rice all the time. And it's like, yeah. But I don't know if everybody knows what Asian people do eat, and also that Asian people is like a ridiculously broad number of people to be categorizing into rice eaters. Um, and I say this because I'm Asian, so like I'm I'm not just like being racist to Asian people for no reason. I'm I'm Chinese American, um, so yeah. Uh, this has been a really long step one. I'm sorry. I guess it's just because, like, I don't develop characters and plot and world building in, like, silos. Everything interacts with each other, so I can't just do it in separate steps. It's like a web of steps that I bounce between. Um, so step two is creating the actual plot. Now, I'm somewhere in between the super hardcore plotters who start with a 30-page outline and then add sentences that evolve into chapters, and the people who just sit down once they have the vibe down and write. Um... I mean, clearly, because I'm fleshing out these characters before I sit down. Maybe you'd have wanted to start writing by now or something? I don't know. Like I said, this is just how I work, and if you work a different way, if, if what uh, your goal is basically just to find what is the fastest way that you can get the highest quality of work, that's how you should judge um, your, uh, your, your scale, uh, and, or like what method you should use, basically. Um, and also, uh, what, and by highest quality, I mean the kind of work that you actually want to be making. Like, what makes, when, what method is getting you the results that make you happy? That's what you gotta do. Um, so yeah, we have these really broad strokes ideas of how this plot might go, but let's, um, brainstorm some additional fun scenes that might pop up in the story. For example, we should have a scene where the dra that we meet the dragons and they're like flying around the ship. Uh, we'll need a first kiss between Sogi and whoever Sogi ends up with at the festival. Um, Sogi and someone else should try to gaslight each other into eating poisonous crawfish, and, uh, each one keeps coming up with excuses for why they can't eat it, just so it's like a, uh, it gaslighting them off. <laughs> and the conversation is, of course, secretly about something else. Um, oh, Sogi should tell someone that the kindest thing that she does is lie to her mother that she loves her. Dang, that's so good. Oh, that's so much emotion. Uh, and then, of course, at some point, Sogi's gonna need to viciously destroy her mother, still by lying um, and saying mean things. And then later, when they re when they um, reconcile, she'll have to say something that's a little bit true, and that will be like a moment where she actually doesn't lie about something. Um, Okay, so usually I put these things on sticky notes, or at least virtual sticky notes, and order them in ways that make sense. But for the purposes of the video, I have already ordered them. Uh, these could each be chapters on their own, uh, but for me, they're more like plot points. Um, each plot point might have be multiple chunks of chapters. Um, some plot points, some chapters might be multiple plot points. Okay, so we're just gonna go over what I've written really quickly. So this is the moon and her faces. Each color is a different person. Uh, and to be clear, all these people know each other before this starts. So uh, before we start, 
we um we have mom forcing Soki to get engaged. Um but then uh aggressively aggressive guns kill the head main people of the Headwater family, put down by Dragon Lady. A wedding is canceled, but Sogi needs to make sure that her family isn't gonna lose all its power in the revolution. Also I had this idea over here. What if the guns were gongs that could mind control dragons? Because now they're more obviously evil. Um uh, and then the ranch family of the Headwater tribe people is gonna hold a conference to determine who the new HUD will be. Uh, Hunter Dude is not into Kelpie Dude. Um, Kelpie Tamer just wants peace and uh, reparations. And Dragon Lady thinks reparations aren't enough and systematic changes are what we need. So, so he walks in with the intention to seduce the Kelpie Tamer and, and to uphold the deal they have with the family. Hunter Dude is confronting Dragon Lady about her role in insurrection and is trying to blackmail and leading. Um, I was thinking maybe because she only switched sides at the last second. And Dragon Lady thinks she can put, prove her goodness to Kelpie Tamer. So they both come in and they're like, uh, hey, marry us. And Kelpie Tamer is like, uh, maybe if you dance real good at the festival, because um, they're just trying not to make this decision right now. And so he's so unimpressed with them that she immediately looks into how to overthrow them. So she goes to Dragon Lady, who, you know, is right before, and I was thinking maybe Sogi is a thing for Dragon Lady until the revolt happened, but she had to pretend she didn't and now she's leaning into it again. Um, Dragon Lady asks the dragons for help and and they're like, well, someone's trying to do a revolt and Sogi overhears this and assumes it means her, so now she has to flip to pretend to be on Dragon Lady's side. And this is maybe the scene where all the dragons are flying around the whole boat. Um, so they decide to investigate together. And uh, this is a start of an investigation arc thingy that would need to be fleshed out more with the actual world building. Uh, remember, world building is just levers that characters can roll, uh, pull to win the game. Also, I want Sogi to weave mm, a very elaborate uh, web of lies that needs to tie into the world building, and then around the like third act, everything starts falling apart. Um, if you can hear that, that's my rabbit eating cardboard. It's fine. Um, and I was saying maybe there's a like a rhythm to the council bolt scene, the council room scenes in the boat where they negotiate the geopolitics, um, which I'll have to figure out later when I have a map and stuff and resources, um, so that their needs make sense with their drama and stuff. And so Sogi starts lying to everyone to get what she wants, and it quickly becomes clear that she can't keep all of her promises. Um, and so then, in like right before the story's climax, like in the dark moment here. Um, this is about where the lie was completely unraveled. So yeah, so just keep that in mind. That's something that I would need to develop more before I really dug into this. So anyways, they're agreeing to investigate together. Um, Dragon Lady, however, immediately goes to this Hunter Dude and is like, Sogi sus. So Hunter Dude starts spying on Sogi. Uh, meanwhile, Mom comes here. By the way, if we're doing the dance subplot, this is where Mom ramps up um, on the dance subplot, maybe an additional dancing rival has to be introduced to cause problems. Um, and Sogi hates this, but she's gonna put up with it for now. Uh, this is like a first Sogi lies and it's bad for her moment. Um, so anyways, uh, however, because she's dancing so much, Kelpie Tamer's like, oh my god, she's like really good at dancing. And so he's like vulnerable and stuff with her because he thinks that you can like see human truth in art and stuff. Um, and she barely holds it together, almost snap because she realizes, but she realizes Hunter Dude is there, so she got it, she's got to keep the, the guys up. Um, so he then is going to confront the Hunter Dude about how much he saw with her almost snapping, and Hunter Dude is trying to suss out how much he likes Helpy Tamer, and if she'd be willing to join his revolt thing. Um, and this is where we're going to have the crawfish scene where they're gaslighting each other, um, but they end up genuinely liking each other because they're similar. Um, meanwhile, this makes Hoagie's mom sad because Sogi's not trying to call or Kelpie dude, and she's messing around with Hunter. I'm sorry, Kelpie, Kelpie non-binary friend. Um, okay, Sogi goes to the dragon lady to exert control over something with her life. So she, because she can't go to Hunter person, because mom says no. Can't go to Kelpie because she hates Kelpie dude, or Kelpie person. So, mm, so he goes to dragon lady, and dragon lady and Sogi reminisce about simpler times, and they like kiss and stuff. But the dragon lady catches Sogi in a lie, and so Sogi was like, listen, the kindest thing I've ever done is lie to my mom. And then we were like, oh, dang. Uh, Sogi Lady, a uh, dragon lady, feigned sympathy, but she doesn't trust Sogi anymore now. Like, this is, that's the end. Dragon lady mm, knows that Sogi was just gonna lie all the time, and that didn't benefit her, and so she sees her kind of as an irrational actor. Um, so, dragon lady goes to Kelpie Tamer. Kelpie Tamer confronts Sogi, 
and then uh, and brings in hunter dude because hunter dude is like you know put down the last revolt so they trust each other um and so he's like um i'm not trying to overthrow you and hunter is like oh i'll vouch for her um but then when kelpie tamer leaves he's like join my revolt plans and so now so he has to figure out how to dismantle his plans and this ties into her whole investigation thing um we have to have some unexpected twists at this point so he's also more interested in Kelpie Tamer at this point because he's nice and open to her even though she thinks that's stupid, but it's also beginning to be endearing. And maybe mm, Kelpie Tamer has had some points, maybe because he like figured out the revolt thing, she thinks he's smarter or something. Um, and I also think it's at this point we need some kind of action beat to push people to reveal their true nature. Uh, I think this would get more fleshed out in world building because of the, I'll, I'll figure out the fact, how the factions interact exactly. Uh, remember world building is levers um so anyways after this encounter so his mom like oh my god you're in a revolt and so he's like oh my god mom shut the fuck up so so he's like oh my god my daughter's so his mom's like oh my god my daughter's secretly a monster and like kelpie tamer don't date her and kelpie tamer goes to sogi is like uh what's up with your mom so sogi's web of lies falling apart and it looks like she's trying involved with revolt um, so she's finally honest about what she wants and what's going on in her family and stuff. And Kelpie Tamer is really sad about this and is vul- and so he has to be vulnerable. And they like worked out and stuff. Um, anyways, Hunter Dude. Oh, so he's honest about what's going on with Kelpie Tamer and um, Hunter Dude and how Hunter Dude's trying to overthrow them. So, so Kelpie Tamer, sad. Hunter Dude, pissed that she revealed the truth, cranks up the timer on his plans. So Sogi has to get Dragon Lady to work with her by not lying. Ooh, spooky. Um, uh, meanwhile, over here, I, we need to ramp up the dance subplot, so she's pressured, and, uh, um, no, oh, I had this idea, here, here, here's me coming up with a new idea, Dragon Lady is the only person she's honest with, and so, um, now she isn't, and so she has to try to, like, gain control and safety with her again, Dragon Lady, like, kind of rewards her in the narrative, but, um, it's still, like, uh, I don't trust you, so, so he's almost falling apart, and so to reward her by the narrative, Kelpie Tamer helps her confront her mom, um, once again, reward is not like, I'm like, uh, it's not like literally a reward from Kelpie Tamer. It's a, uh, narrative reward for her making good choices for her life. Um, so anyways, Sogi and Mom make up. Um, maybe Sogi's like, I didn't hate you until you hurt me, and then I didn't feel anything, but maybe if you stopped hurting me, I could feel something again, and Mom, like, actually takes some accountability. The true fantasy? Uh, uh, Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, story's climax, so since she's fixed a relationship and she's more vulnerable and she trusts, uh, we can, mm, we've got Sogi's network of truth and lies versus Hunter Dude's lie, network of lies and coercion, and so Kelpie mm, lies for the first time through a mission or something to show that lies and deception are, in fact, a part of successful leadership and negotiation. Sogi mostly tells the truth during this, and Hunter Dude's overthrown, but he isn't bitter, because remember, he believes in order and stuff. Uh, Dragon Lady has actually promised her reforms, no lies this time. Um, I think this has to tie into the uh, unraveling uh, lie thing, the, the web of lies up there. Um, and so uh, now we have, uh, they go to the dance competition in peace and she gets to win. And since we're going to have lots of fake ki- kisses, um, and or so he like hates the kiss, uh, here's her first real one with Kelpie Tamer. And that's the end. That's who apparently she's going to end up with based off of these dynamics. So yeah, that's that's a plot. Now, some of you might want might want to dig into these specific stop plot points more before you start writing. I know I would really like before I would start wanting to write more than like a scene, I would really need to dig into the world building more. But for the purpose of this video, I'm just going to jump into writing the first scene. So, step 3 is writing the very first sentence. In my first sentences, I like to try to include all of the following. Character, setting, tone, and the goal slash conflict. I know some people might say that's too clunky or hard to get one sentence, um, but uh, if so if you can only get one, I'd say focus on tone. You need to set the tone correctly, because having a good voicey tone will also kind of establish the character and setting, at least in a mood sense. So, and that's how you get people to keep reading, is that you, you gotta feel like you have something unique to say. Um, so our first scene, if you'll recall, is Sogi walks in with the intention to try to seduce the Kelpie Tamer to uphold his cousin's question mark wedding proposal. Um, if we're writing this in prose and going in first person, then we might say, The delicate bells of my sedan 
interrupted both the river ship's hum and the uncertain stammer of the so-called heir to the Ellison family, just as arranged. So, we have characters, with my and heir to the Ellison family. We have setting, implied by Sedan, which if you don't know, mm, it, not the brand, but those uh, fancy chairs that you carry rich people in, um, as well as river ship's hum, tells us that we're both on a river ship and that it has an engine, because why else would it hum? Uh, the tone is confident, with just as arranged, and kind of irre uh, irreverent, which you can tell from the so-called and the, the contrast in uncertain stammer. Um, and the conflict is hidden, hidden blah, 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 hinted at in the tone itself and in the word interrupted. Uh, this sounds active, like the interruption was a choice. Um, I could have used a more neutral term, like sounded. Uh, the, the, bell, the delicate bells sounded over the river ship's hum, or something lyrical like chimed over the river ship's hum, but the delicate bells interrupting is exactly the kind of social attack that I think is really befitting of a liar like Soki. Alternatively, if we were in third person, we might make it Soki ensured the delicate bells of her sedan interrupted the air when they first brought her into the Ellison ship's war room. Uh, this has a more neutral tone at the moment, but you still have a good sense of her character through the phrasing she ensured the bells interrupted. Um, and we also have the lovely dehumanization of the servants, which is something Soki would absolutely do, and also something that we can like have her deal with later, deal with the consequences of later. Um, I like my third person with really close psychic distance, though. I think it makes emotions a lot more palpable. Um, but you could actually give the whole thing a different vibe with a third person narrator that has their own strong voice and vibe. Maybe lean into that New Orleans tall tale vibe with the voice. Um, and this brings me to what we call linguistic landscapes. It's basically the idea for every written piece, there are words that define the piece and give it a particular sound and vibe. For example, people often complain about anachronisms like okay, champagne, electric, or gotcha, uh, and so forth in fantasy works, uh, because it doesn't fit the, the vibe of the times. Like, can you imagine Frodo in Lord of the Rings being like, okay, let me just turn off the electric lights real quick. Like, it doesn't feel correct, right? Um, meanwhile, if you're writing about Californian teens in the years 2025, they absolutely would not say, aw, gee willikers, unironically. I mean, probably, I assume. That doesn't sound right to me. Um, one of like my favorite go-to short pieces, uh, short fiction pieces, is How to Slaughter by Shailen Bishop. It's what I read whenever I need a reminder of what like my dream voice sounds like. Um, and it has this gorgeous linguistic landscape with phrases like, My eyes glass so I could watch the slaughter through a kaleidoscope. Peeling girlhood from girl. Chopped her strawberry blonde braid off at the chin so it slashed at her jugular like a brass knife. My room had two windows that met in the corner over my bed, blades of gold colliding between them at sunset, and so forth. You can see this makes this really, like, like, you can see the focus on knives and carving, and it works really nicely with the title, How to Slaughter, even though it's about a relationship of a queer couple. It's pretty cute. I like it. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's called How to Slaughter, so you, you already know how this is going to end. Anyway, so depending on how your brain works, it might behoove you to try to make your linguistics landscape before you start, or in the editing phase. I generally prefer to do this in the editing step, but I bring it up now because I know some people like to really do it early. Um, so when you do it, um, you may you can start by like making a list of like 20 to 50 words you really want to use. Uh, I would say focus on nouns, verbs, um, and uh, I guess adjectives and adverbs, but they're definitely less useful. Uh, because and people can absolutely fight me on this. Um, but it's the whole don't say moved quickly when you can say ran, you know, or like dashed or etc. Like, n there are definitely exceptions, but uh, focusing on nouns and strong verbs, really strong, interesting verbs, has made my writing sound so much better to my ears, so maybe it'll help you too. Uh, step four, now that you have the first sentence, I, I find that's usually the hardest for people, um, that blank page syndrome, you know, um, it's just a matter of writing until you get to the end. And as I mentioned in my Everything You Need to Know About Storytelling video, different people are going to have different ways they want to approach writing the whole thing. Some people work better in frantic bursts when they have energy, Other works, others work forcing themselves to write a little bit every day, making it a habit with like momentum. Um, some people might require external validation with alpha readers cheering you on after you post every chapter. Um, others people might need to write the whole thing in secrecy without showing anyone um, until beta reading time. I know that's what Stephen King does. Um, and others yet might still need to switch between methods at different points in their life. And I think you just need to experiment and find the best balances between the resources that you put in, time and energy, and the quality you get out. 
In the past, I wrote whenever I felt like it, and I got plenty done for my liking. But as I've been navigating my post-COVID fatigue issues over the last few years here, I've discovered that forcing myself to write a little, as in minimum one sentence, every day tends to net me more progress than only writing when I have energy. Usually that one sentence turns into at least a paragraph, and the slightly lower quality of that one por forced paragraph is better progress for me than zero progress, especially now that I'm a stronger editor and so I can just edit it. Um, now, I'm obviously not writing this whole thing into a novel, but I will link the mirror board for you so you can look at it and steal it. Uh, but now, as a special treat, I will read you the first little section of how I would write what I am tentatively calling The Moon and Her Faces. Sogi despised the soft murmur of the Elison air even more than the gaudy gems and crocodile skin rugs of their ship. A weak child like that had no place in Riverfolk politics, especially not in the wake of the dragon riots of the last three years. The last one ended with the whole Elisen family dead. What did this baby think they could do? Ask everyone to be kind and they all go home fam happy? She sighed internally, but her face wore the same veil of mild amusement as always. So he fastened her moon-mirrored coins to her skirt, luxuriant sable chimes usually reserved for festivals, dancers, and theater ships. But wasn't all the world a stage? She checked her expression in one of them and raised her brow a little more. No need to even hint at her displeasure. She had to marry the bastard. The clock in the waiting hall whistled noon. That was her cue. And if they were late, that was their fault. A servant began to slide open the door, but she shoved past into the stage, the Ellison war room. All eyes turned to the chimes of the bells and her perfected laughter. Hello, hello, everyone. May the moon shine bright over your fields. It is I, your most humble servant, Sogi, the initiated. The uninitiated. A murmur ran through the crowd. She spun and offered them a crescent bow. That's her? That's the last heir's fiancé? We've really kept her waiting. They had, but she was here now. The new heir stared up at her with daunted eyes in a too stiff pose. Her smile became a little more real. This would be so easy. And then, of course, naturally, it immediately becomes a disaster as the as the Kelpie Tamer guy is like, uh, excuse me, you are... I can already tell that you are bad vibes and bad news and I don't want to marry you. And then she's like, oh my lord, what a baby. And then, you know, and then conflict ensues. Alright, well, thank you so much for watching, uh, and special thanks again to Blue Mooney for this wonderful collab. Um, all of you, please go subscribe to her so that you can uh, see her part of the collab when it comes out. And um, I, of course, did my own festival, and uh, for Blue Mooney, since she's doing it on stream, I didn't want to just make a video that she has to watch because that's not as an interactive. And so I made it more like this puzzle where there's not words that describe what's going on at the festival. So she's going to have to pick, figure it out from pictures and context clues and stuff. So I, I'm really excited for the archaeology work I'm making her do. I'm very excited. I want to try to do more videos like this in the future, by the way. So if you have any ideas that you want somebody else to shove a plot in for you, if you want me to do this with uh, your story ideas, uh, go ahead and drop them down below or hit me up on discord uh and i'll see you all next time Bye bye